As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. Happy Eastering. This is the third Sunday of Anastasis, the Greek word for resurrection, the third Sunday of Easter. And our Eastering continues in this week with the passages that we have. First of all, from Acts, the third chapter. Uh, this is the famous passage of Peter healing the, the, um, the disabled beggar. And uh, we begin here, according to the lectionary, at verse 12. When Peter saw this, um, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? They were kind of astonished at what he had done. Um, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk again? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. Though we had decided to let him go, you disowned the holy and righteous one, asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. And it goes on. The author of life. I love that phrase. Jesus, the author of life. Um, you have a life story. The biggest, one of the biggest questions in your life is who are you, allow, who are you going to let author your life story, because whoever authors your life story is your authority for life. And if you say, I'm going to offer, I'm going to author my own life story, then you, yourself, are the author. But to be a disciple of Jesus is to submit and surrender the authorship and to live the Jesus story in you and through you and to let Christ live his resurrection life in and through us. So this author of life phrase is really, really key here. Psalm 4 has, a, um, has one of these uh, litanies. How long, how long, how long, O Lord, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? And then it goes, how long, how long, how long? So it's a, it's a really good uh, psalm for that, um, that litany of how long, how long, and how many times have you and I in our own life, wonder how long, Lord, how long? And frustration both with, with God sometimes, frustration with ourselves. How long are you going to continue to think these thoughts? How long are you going to you know, let, this, let this go and let this happen? The um, first John reading, John, first John 3, 1 to 7, I'm going to let you all look that up because I want to spend the time today on the, on the passage here from Luke 24. And it says 36b to 48. But uh, this is the ending uh, just before the ascension story of the post-resurrection appearances in Luke. The Emmaus Road has already taken place. And then you have this, this story here uh, about Jesus' appearance to his disciples. I'm just going to read the, the whole thing. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a gay ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do, you, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he said to them, Do you have anything to eat? See, Jesus is always hungry. I mean, <laughs> you know, each one of the post-resurrection appearances we talked about last week, there's some food involved. And here again, give me something to eat. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, 
This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses of these things. I mean, can you imagine the magic of what it was like to be there as Jesus tells his own story to his disciples and opens up the scriptures to them so they could understand it and starts at the beginning and goes to that moment. I mean, just think about how incredible that was. What a, what a magic moment that was. Now, the phrase here is, you are witnesses of these things. It's the same phrase that we get before in the Peter story, um, where Peter is saying, you were witnesses of this. And, and here we have Jesus saying to his disciples, you are witnesses of these things. Now, what does it mean to be a witness? What is, it, what is the, the meaning of the word uh, witness? Um, the word witness is a English variant of the word martyr. A martyr is literally a witness. Martyrs are defined as witnesses. But Jesus here, here's what he says, you are witnesses, you are I'm calling you to be martyrs. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with, up, with power from on high. Um, so he's sending us out under the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit to be... Now, but when we think of martyr, we think of a martyr in death. No. Witness here, this is a, he's calling us to be martyrs in life. A life martyr, not a death martyr, but to be a life martyr, to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, we are all called to be martyrs, but living martyrs, living witnesses. A few will, call, will be called to be martyrs to the death, death martyrs. But the word martyr here. We've got to reclaim this word because it really means we're to be martyrs in life, witnesses in life. And so what does it mean to be, to be a martyr? Now, I don't want to, I don't want to um, kind of depreciate in any way um, the importance of martyrs uh, to the death and who have, whose witnesses have caused their, their death. Um, we are at a time... David Barrett, who the great missiologist, he claims that one in every 200 Christians living today can expect to be martyred. Now, I think that may be a little exaggerated, but he, he writes, and these are his words, martyrdom has been a standard accompaniment of Christian mission because Christians inevitably arouse hostilities and they pay the price. Um, maybe we aren't arousing enough hostilities today, so maybe we got to raise the roof a little more. But... Um, but there, there, so there is a, um, a reality to the, the, the understanding of martyr as a martyr in death. Now, Christians are being persecuted around the world. Um, we arguably, um, as Christianity is dying in the West, it's surging in the South and in the East. But that is precisely to where the persecution of Christians is is growing leaps and bounds. Now, the good news is COVID-19 actually has been somewhat of a reprieve against violence um, for, against Christians, with the exception of sub-Saharan Africa, where the intensity of violence against Christians increased from 2019 to 2020 by at least a, a third. In, in North Korea, just to give you some examples of some of the living martyrs today uh, who are martyrs to the death, in North Korea, you can be killed instantly 
if you're found out to be a Christian, or best taken to a labor camp as a political criminal. Between 50,000 and 75,000 Christians are currently in prison in North Korea just for being, guess what, Christian. 50 to 75,000 brothers and sisters imprisoned for their faith. In Eritrea, called the North Korea of East Africa, the Eritrean Orthodox Church, EOC, is the only Christian denomination recognized by the government, and the EOC, in other words, the Christian denomination itself, teams up with the government to monitor phone calls and conduct raids on rival denominations. So, and it can be the same way, at lesser scale, but in Ethiopia, and um, the government partnerships with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. I, I love that church, but the way in which they are persecuting like Pentecostals, Evangelicals, are not part of that Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Afghanistan has tied with North Korea for the last three years, the number one spot in the World Watch list, most persecuted Christians. They still practice honor killings on family members that become Christian because you shame the family by converting away from Islam to, to Christianity. And so honor killings are are there. Um, Christians are high-value targets for Islamic terrorist groups, Al-Shabaab, you all know that. In China, any, any religious venue, you don't dare call them churches, um, you can expect surveillance cameras that have face recognition. Um, where, when the government finds out that you are meeting, even just sub, you know, just kind of surreptitiously meeting, just for meals, the cameras go up where face recognition, so all of um, you are recorded. Your recordings are coming and going, are, are recorded. Um, so there are persecutions going on in the world today. So I don't want to diminish this. Um, and, and there is something, I mean, there, um, a, a faith that is not coddled but is challenged. Uh, is is a stronger faith? I mean, why do you ever wonder why Mormon um, continue their two-year missionary stint? Studies have shown this is one of the least effective means of evangelism for the Mormon Church. So why do they put all their kids through two years of doing nothing but door knocking, knowing that they're going to get laughed at, um, mocked, sl door slammed in their face, um, with very little results? Why do they do it? Well, they do it. Because once you've been through that two-year period, um, once you've been through that process of standing up for your faith in the face of opposition and hostility and, and, and mockery, you're, you're bonded for life. It strengthens your faith. It hardens your faith. It makes it stronger and more resilient. So... Um, there is something here. I love this prayer of, of Cyprian um, of Carthage. He, he lived during a terrible time of persecution. And when he died in, as a martyr in, in 258, this is the prayer that uh, he wrote. And um, I love this prayer. We believe and trust, Lord, that at this time of terrible persecution, you will hear and answer our prayers with the utmost urgency. We pray with all our hearts that you will give us courage to remain true to the gospel and proclaim your name right up till the moment of death. Then may we emerge from the snares of this world with our souls unscathed and rise from the darkness of the world into your glorious light. As we have been linked together by love and peace, and together we have endured persecution, may we rejoice together in the kingdom of heaven. Martyrs in death. But what does it mean to be martyrs in life, to be witnesses in life and witnesses to life? And that is what Jesus, that's what the resurrection is all about. We are to be martyrs to a life story that is based in this, the resurrection, a, a risen, rising, and regnant Lord. And that's the kind of martyrdom, a lifestyle of constant witnessing to the risen power of the risen Christ um, that I'm, I'm talking about here. Um, there, there's a NBC show, uh, I've only seen a couple of episodes, but it's in its third season. It's called Manifest. And it's the story of a, 
uh, Flight 838, I don't know why I remember that, but Flight 838, I think it was going from Jamaica to New York City or something. And there was turbulence in the air and suddenly it disappeared. Um, they could not find any remains of it for five and a half years. And after five and a half years, the plane, everybody, everybody surprised, landed. And everybody on the plane was, this, was five and a half years younger than everybody else in the world. In other words, it's like the plane was held in, in suspension. And these survivors, I think there were 191 survivors of flight and crew, the survivors, the stories of those 191 survivors and their life, and the, what changed them after they had been through that experience of being together on that plane and had gone missing for five and a half years, and they don't, they don't remember anything other than just turbulence and then landing. Every single one of those survivors experiences a calling. That's what they call it. A calling. That calling summons them to some kind of redemption, rescue, saving, healing. I mean, it's a calling to a mission. It's a calling to a witness. And, and if they don't answer that calling, then their, their life gets, gets torn apart. And... and and bad things happen, and so they are all changed by that moment in that air, whatever happened, and that's part of the mystery of, that's why it's gone on for three seasons now. You're wondering what in the world happened in that five and a half years, where do they go, what do they do? But it's a, it's a resurrection story, if you will. But after the resurrection, they all have a, yeah, calling. We all, sisters and brothers, we have a calling to be a witness. We have a calling to be martyrs in life, a witness in life, to be living martyrs, living witnesses to the power of, of the resurrection. Uh, there, there is a, um, a really weird group. It, it's so weird, I love this group. I, I, they're called the Muggletonians. And I've always suspected that um, uh, J.K. Rowling um, got her word muggles in the Potterverse from these Muggletonians. Now, I have no idea if this is true or not. I'm just, um, but the Muggles were in the ordinary, non-magical world. They were just ordinary people, the Muggles. And the Muggletonians, they were, they were people who were in the 17th century, uh, founded by two guys that thought they were the, the two prophets uh, foretold in the book of Revelation. And uh, they didn't, they just lived ordinary lives. They didn't practice worship. They didn't have any kind of rituals. What they did is they just ate together, went to bars together, um, drank together. This is 1660, 70, 80. Um, but they had, a, they had a firm rule that they would never witness. They would never evangelize. And they would never tell that they were a Muggletonian. In 1979, supposedly the last Muggletonian died, and the only way we know he was a Muggletonian is that when he died, his wife found in the garage all the Muggletonian documents and, and historic uh, artifacts. And the only way a Muggletonian can reveal that they're a Muggletonian is that they cannot lie. So if you ask them, are you a Muggletonian? They have to say, I am a Muggletonian. And this wife had never known that her husband was the last, they think, the last remaining, who knows? Are you a Muggletonian? Well, they think she was the last, he was the last remaining Muggletonian because she had never asked him. She had never asked him. And so he never revealed who he was. Now, I like part of this. I mean, I, you shouldn't have to ask, uh, you know, we shouldn't have to go around saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a, uh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, and broadcast, you know, our, 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 our Christian status to everybody. They should be able to see, but they should be able to see this. And they shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to guess, you know, are you a Christian? No. We should show it. I mean, we should be a, 
a witness. And how do we show it in our, our witness? Well, we live lives that showcase the resurrection power of Jesus the Christ and what it means to be, live a life of. And that's where I, Jesus is, is embodied Torah. He's just continuing the Torah. So Micah 6, 8, a Micah 6, 8 life where we, hear me, love mercy. The, the word here is hesed, which translates loving kindness. I love that. Steadfast love faithfulness, mercy. I mean, it's untranslatable into English because it has so many nuances. But what does it mean to... So we show, and I love that loving kindness. How many times have you heard that word anymore? Loving kindness, such a beautiful phrase. So a life of loving kindness to people, a life of hesed, a life of ju do justice. Now you love mercy, you do justice. We got a lot of people that love justice, but they don't want to, they don't want anything to do with mercy. No. You do justice. When you see injustice, you confront it and you do justice in the face of injustice. You do justly. You love mercy, but you walk humbly. And that is a living witness to the resurrection power of, of Jesus Christ. Um, a martyr in life. A witness to life. One of my favorite stories, and it, it, it's hard to get this one right uh, because we don't have any sure account and final account. Um, but it's of a, a monk from the East. His name is Telemachus. Lived in the 4th, 5th century. And Telemachus was an ascetic monk, lived in a monastery. We're not even sure what monastery. We know he was from the East. But he just felt the prompting of the Spirit. i got to go to Rome. He didn't know why he had to go to Rome, but he had to go to Rome. And so he, he kind of put all of his belongings, which didn't, wasn't much, and put them in a little sack and had a stick, you know, like, um, and just put it over his shoulder and walked to Rome. When he got into Rome, now this is, you know, the late 4th century here, um, like, you know, 390, in the 390s. He, um, he was kind of swept up into uh, a crowd, and the crowd was going to the stadium. Uh, these stadiums, uh, glad, there was a gladiator, circus, gladiator event they were celebrating. Now this time Rome, remember the Roman Empire, uh, the Christianity was the, it was the established religion. So the, the Roman Empire, his name was Heron, uh, Honorius, H-O-N-O-R-I-U-S, Honorius. Um, he was a Christian. The people that were going to the gladiator games were supposed to be Christians. And Telemachus, when he went to the, he was swept up and he went into the stadium and he looked at what was going on. And there were all these people killing, the gladiators killing each other. They were, they were killing animals. It was just a bloodshed down there. And he's going, what is going on here? And so he in the midst of these gladiators killing each other to the death and fighting these, there's a lot of things going on at the, at the, in the stadium at the, at the same time. He went down there, there's this little monk, and started to separate the gladiators from each other. And he, he would say, in Christ's name, stop. And he started yelling, in Christ's name, stop. And he run from one, tried to separate them, in Christ's name, stop. And, and he just he was uh, kind of scattering here and there and just scurrying around in Christ's name stop. And finally the, the the crowd started to get angry. And 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 somebody in the crowd, you know, they kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. And so supposedly, now there's two accounts here. I think probably both are right. But one of the gladiators killed him. Just stop it and put a sword into his heart. And as he fell on the ground. And the blood spattered. He was still saying, in Christ's name, stop. And the crowd started throwing things at him. Now, one account says the crowd's the one that killed him. Another account says that the gladiators, I think probably, gladiators killed him first. And then the crowd. When Honorius heard the story of this simple monk who tried to stop the bloodshed and brutality of the gladiator games, he was so convicted that he put an end to the gladiator games. And it was the 
witness of one monk, Telemachus, one little unknown monk who brought an end to the gladiator games and they were forever stopped. A martyr in death, but first a martyr to life. In the name of Jesus Christ, stop. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. Do justly. Love mercy, loving kindness, and walk humbly. A living martyr. Semiotics is the art of angling, of turning things askew, upside down, inside out, cattywampus, sunny side up, over easy, scrambled, hard boiled. We hope you enjoyed today's journey, but always remember it's more important you prepare the preacher than you prepare the sermon. <laughs>